really super thrilled to have him here. He's going to be speaking in Chicago as well. Let's give him a big round of applause, Antonio Garcia. On January 6th, uh, around 8.15 p.m., I was coming home from dinner with my wife about two blocks away from the house, and she said, pull over, there's a man in the street. He's been hit by a car. And we pulled over uh, just about where that cop car is on the right. And I got out, and uh, maybe about 10 steps ahead of her, running up to this man that we saw. Um, I was about as close to this block. And there were people on the street, and there was a car in front of him, and it was strangely calm. Um, there wasn't glass, the car wasn't smashed up. There were a few people on their phones. And when I looked at him, there was a, just a little pool of blood behind his head. And his body was sort of contorted a little bit. But it didn't look like a man who got hit by a car. And I realized that in fractions of seconds upon encountering him, this man did not get hit by the car. And my wife caught up, and I, and I shielded her eyes, and I, I said, uh, they already called for an ambulance. Uh, let's go back to the car. And it turns out that this man, two blocks away from our house in Irving Park in Chicago, um, had been shot multiple times in the head minutes before we had pulled up. And it made me sick to witness, and it made me sad to later read that his parents didn't have money to give him a funeral. And it made me angry that the way it was reported, they moved the boundary line of where the incident had happened one block over to Albany Park, which is predominantly a Latino neighborhood with uh, more recognition for crime, gang activity, and statistics, even though this happened in Irving Park, right? That was a small data point contributed, plus one, Irving Park. This didn't happen here, it happened there. And so in this moment, it was this real life punch in the face, making tangible what I had been reading about and hearing about for years about organizations and grassroots groups and activists fighting hard to to work on the violent situation in Chicago. And I had become immune to it and just sort of said, anytime you heard the statistics, like, that's Chicago, right? And in the first three months of 2016, murders in Chicago were up 72% from the year before. And shootings had surged 88%. And when they say shootings, that's not one shot fired. That's multiple shots. Many of those don't hit their intended to target and instead hit other people. And I say all of this because every once in a while you encounter something super personal and super visceral that tells you to wake up and do something. And so in the space that we're in, as makers and designers and developers, um, I started to think more about that and what we might do to support activism with technology. Um, and it's not just technology, right? It's, it's all of those things that sort of come bundled with it. So with open source, with information, with social media, with data viz, mobile apps, video, podcasts, photographs, blogs, maybe more photographs, maps, animation, and the internet. Right? What we're talking about are channels and platforms. Um, but they're inanimate. They don't really do anything unless we do something to them or with them. And most of them, the big ones that we think about first, they were never designed or developed with activism in mind. They were designed for all sorts of other reasons. So um, quick, just so I can get a sense of people, and people have been doing this almost every presentation. But quick show of hands. Uh, Designers, keep them up. Um, developers, 
programmers, engineers, um, maybe product managers, hackers, technologists, other roles like marketers and copywriters, right? That, that, that's, that's the whole group. Now show of fists, where are my activists at? Nice. There's probably more activists in the room than raise their hands, that's my guess. Because it feels a little weird to say you're an activist. We're totally comfortable with our roles at work, right? Designer, oh, I, I will own that label, right? Interaction designer. But when we say activists, you sort of start to quantify that or qualify that and, and ask yourself, well, what does he really mean by activist? Like, am I marching in the streets about something or am I, you know, liking a group on Facebook? And so I want to spend a little bit of time digging into that as a definition, right? So Wikipedia, other things like that, give this nice, long uh, efforts to promote, impede, direct social, political, economic, or environmental change, or stasis, with the desire to make improvements in society and to correct social injustice. But if you remove all the jargon and you just get away from the dictionary definition, it's essentially to take action to affect change. Right? It's participatory. It's intentional. It's resonant. It's affecting. As problem solvers, which everybody in this room is, it should come natural to us. It does come natural. That's what we do, right? We're given a brief or we see something and we go, well, we can make that better. Let's do that, right? If we can get all fired up about a restaurant menu using papyrus, we should be able to do something pretty significant. <laughs> Unless it's an Egyptian restaurant, then it totally makes sense. <laughs> All right, so action, change. That kind of reciprocal thing is what we'll talk about today. Uh, so yeah, action, change, action, change, action, change, right? That, those are two things to hold in your mind as we talk through this. Okay. So a little bit about me. Who's this guy getting up here telling us how we should act and participate and, and all this stuff? Um, I'm not an expert on any of this. I didn't even study, you know, um, political science or, or anything that typically leads people to a, a life of activism, at least from an academic standpoint. Um, but my grandparents emigrated from Puerto Rico. My dad was blue collar. He worked on the tarmac at O'Hare, back-breaking work, literally slinging bags, blew out discs in his back. My mom was a nurse. And they generally taught me to fight for the underdog, just on principle. Became straight edge in junior high, joined uh, United Young Sisters and Brothers in high school. I was the only non-black participant. Attended KKK counter rallies. When I was in junior high, they, uh, or in high school, they showed up to my, to my neighborhood courthouse to like have a rally. And you know, everybody skateboarded up and we blared super loud music and a mariachi band came and we drowned them out and it was just awesome. Um, and in college, I joined the Universal Zulu Nation, b-boy, hip-hop head. Uh, marched against police brutality in Atlanta, made a documentary while I was in art school about homeless people living in the 40 yards where I used to do a lot of graffiti. And then I moved back to Chicago. I joined Firebelly Design, which is a socially responsible brand strategy, small company in, in uh, the Puerto Rican neighborhood of Humboldt Park. And all of our work was for people uh, and organizations in the social sector. And after that, I left for Gravity Tank, which is an innovation consultancy similar to IDO, if you're familiar with them. Uh, and I started our social innovation practice, working in healthcare and education. Now I work inside of a bank. It's a whole other talk. Um, but I say all of that, to, to, those, were the, those were sort of the highlights as I was thinking about this, that I felt like I could stand on and say, I've seen and done some of this stuff, and I know what it feels like. And strangely, um, while I felt wide awake at all those different points, um, I got to this other point where I didn't quite feel as awake. And maybe that's where some of you are at right now. Um, so a friend, Nick Brown, asked me to speak at Glapit Nova last year um, at Google in Chicago. And the topic was on um, uh, activism and protesting in the informational age. And I was up there with some really, really great people. Um, to my left, Fabian Elliott, uh, global co-chair of the Black Googler Network, working really hard to turn Chicago into uh, a black tech mecca. Um, to my right was Christiana Rey Colon, 
She's the founder of the Let Us Breathe Collective. She's a HBO Deaf Poetry uh, winner. Um, and to the left of Fabian was uh, Becky Stachetti, Director of Engagement and Programming at Kartimkin Films, which is a really big um, documentary film group based in Chicago. And there was me, this consultant from Gravity Tank, interaction designer, and I just felt inadequate up there against this, these other people because they were all actively doing something really compelling and moving. Um, and I was there you know, making user experiences better for people, which you know, there's great merit in that because there's plenty of work to do in the space. But in that moment, I felt like I had lost my edge somehow. Um, and the things that they were talking about were, were these real movements they were part of. And, and I was there kind of just commenting on the informational age side of that title. Um, and, it, and, it, and it made me feel weird a little bit. Um, and around the same time, my sister um, was talking about getting married, which doesn't sound like a very interesting thing, except that she's gay. And so there was suddenly this very real situation in my face that uh, she might not legally be able to do that at the time. And that felt weird, right? And there's another instance where like reality was there presenting itself in this really personal, visceral way, and I couldn't really ignore it. And that stirred something up in me. Um, and then, like I mentioned later on, that shooting. And so um, it got me wondering, uh, what do I need to do to sort of reignite that bit within me? Um, and, uh, and I don't want to debate um, slacktivism and activism, and like that's not what I'm here to do or to shame anybody for how they participate in things. Um, because I think there's actually really interesting bits, sort of no matter how you do it. And it's maybe a, a spectrum. Um, but I do want to talk about what I think works and what I think we could do more of, and if you're interested, like how to turn the volume up on some of those things as designers and developers and people who create experiences for, for others. Um, so who signed the, uh, the SOPA petition at some point? Yeah. Nice. 2011 Stop Online pa uh, Piracy Act. They used Tumblr as their primary platform uh, at the time. And it's noted as one of the most successful civic campaigns to use social media and modern web technologies, but it wasn't fought and won online. Um, when you look at the statistics from Fight for the Future, there's a whole bunch of things that were happening in real life. Um, and they were happening because people were doing stuff. Right? People were making calls. People were signing petitions. People were emailing. Um, there were a hundred on the ground protests. Like that's, that's awesome. People camped out on the FCC's lawn for 10 days. And I guess what I'm talking about is this digital physical action. Technology helped facilitate it, but it was people doing stuff on the ground, um, kind of ignited by all these bits of technology that sort of strung them together and painted this bigger picture. And they said, I want to be part of that narrative. I want to do something. I want to sign that petition because I believe in that thing. <clears throat> and another case, maybe more recent, um, is the Egyptian revolution in Tahrir Square. And it's another one that lots of people point to and say, you know, well, that's thanks to, to Google and Facebook and, and, and these sort of, these sort of platforms that were in existence that made this possible. And in 2000, uh, internet penetration in Egypt was less than 1%. It was like 0.7%. That's like less than Tunisia and Iran. That's crazy to me. Um, and lots of people say, well, you know, it, it was this, it, it was um, wild um, Gonim's work and, and people getting together on Facebook, right? And, and, and these companies, they, they were happy to take credit for being, you know, the, the platform for which revolution came to Egypt upon. But it was really this perfect storm, um, rising levels of connectivity, you know, mobility uh, through, the, through the roof, um, and on platforms that were totally overlooked by the secret police and government-controlled media. These were, these were sort of old people out of touch with how young people were communicating and they disregarded social media as like a, a thing that, that they should be threatened by. They underestimated it. Um, but it's also because Egypt is a lot of really young people living in highly urban areas. 
So you had this, this thing happening that wasn't really technology by itself, but a lot of other things. And so, um, you know, yes, the Facebook page, we are uh, all Saeed. Um, it was a great NPR interview with Wael Gonem, if you're curious. But it was a coalition of human rights activists, lawyers, bloggers, labor organizers. Lots of people were involved in this, and they distributed pictures of, uh, and videos of, of, of torture, and they distributed protest manuals, how to conduct yourself in these protests. They were learning from Tunisia and other places and saying, we got to do it differently than them. Um, and they were using open source mapping tools. They were using a lot of really cool things. It wasn't just Facebook alone. Um, and so Simon Manwaring, who uh, was former Widening Kennedy here in Portland, was interviewed by Fast Company from a brand standpoint to analyze sort of how, how did this happen? How did they pull it off um, if it wasn't just technology by itself? And, and he broke it down um, into these, these three areas. Um, the idea of vertical threshold, like going deep, this penetration, this focal point <clears throat> that everybody could um, identify. And then expanding the ranks, this horizontal expansion, um, broadening reach, aligning around shared values. That was the whole idea of introducing labor organizers into it and other people that had um, reason to, to care, but maybe if they only had played uh, one piece of it, you know, youth uprising, it wouldn't have gathered everybody. So they had to sort of um, make, uh, make obvious the benefits to other groups to participate. Um, and then to scale all those connections between people so you could really achieve density and disseminate change and counter misinformation. So there was a strategy there. Whether it was recognized at the beginning or not, you could, in retrospect, see it. Um, so who did this? Just a show of hands. Don't be embarrassed if you did it. It's, it's a thing, right? Or maybe you did this and you did the, the marriage equality equal sign. Um, and when you did this, you were making some kind of statement. You were taking a stand. You and 26 million other people did this. And it said to their friends and their family and their coworkers how they felt about marriage equality as an issue. Um, and you could say, well, that didn't really bring about change. And that was like decades of hard work and, um, and lobbying and this whole road that was paved by, um, by activists before them. And that is all true. Um, but I think it's profound on this kind of a thing, which is a hot topic, to say where you stand on it. Um, but by itself, maybe it's not, it doesn't feel like, a, like enough. Um, and so Melanie Tenenbaum, she's a, a social psychologist. She actually has done some studying around this, and she said, when people are trying to change behavior, they often focus on telling people what they should do. But we often underestimate just how strongly we respond to what other people actually do. So by you putting that forth, and this is sort of what she studied, is you know, kind of the, the ripple effect or the recognition when you see your entire Facebook feed in this, this you know, wall of, of, of rainbow patterns. And then you start to make these connections between people. Um, I think it's very different um, than doing this. Not that either one are right or wrong, but who wouldn't stand with victims of terrorism? Right? Like that's, that's not a hot topic to make a statement on and say, I'm over here and I believe in this. That's, that's just that solidarity, that's empathy, um, and that's valuable. But one brings about change um, in, a, in a way, and the other is, is a display of this solidarity and empathy. And it kind of sort of feels like this a little bit, um, because there's not a there's not a a peer to peer action necessarily taking place, um, and that that's that's you know what critics of this kind of participation um, always say, you know this is not quantifiable, um, but you could think of uh, another scenario maybe where an organization might match some sort of donation and say for every message about this uh, uh, terrorist attack that is retweeted, we will donate you know, a dollar or something to, um, to actions being taken place uh, in Paris. And that could be something, right? Like where we, we've got a number we can track as people retweet this, this compelling message of um, solidarity and unity. And then every time that happens, we're going we're gonna to put some money towards the situation or we're going to send some volunteers or we're going to do something physical on the ground for this digital action. 
Never mind that Wired estimates that 70% of tweets go unread. Um, so more people have been looking at this, this idea of social media and participating in that way. Um, and uh, sadly, this, this study coming out of um, British Columbia's Sauter School of Business identified that social media might not actually lead to more meaningful support. And um, Kirk Christofferson, who authored the report, said if people are able to declare support for a charity publicly in social media, uh, it can actually make them less likely to donate later on. So the study had said, you know, they, they, they essentially gave people a few ways to demonstrate support. Uh, one was the more private signing of a partition, uh, of a petition. Um, the other was a small token item like a, a magnet or a pin, and the other one was, uh, was something on social, liking something or, or tweeting something. And then they circled back to all those same people who participated in all those different ways, and they asked them to donate. And the people who had signed petitions and did this sort of private gesture of their commitment uh, were more likely to give money than the people who had said, well, I, I kind of already did that, didn't I? When I said I liked it, I'm good. And I think that's really interesting and, and I don't know, it just kind of bums me out. All right, and then this, like more recently, right? Tim Cook and Apple's decision not to unlock the iPhone at the center of this San Bernardino case. Um, I'm not going to make any statements about this other than this, right? This is a pretty big thing. Um, and it riled up some people. Um, and Tim Cook was, was interviewed in, in um, Time Magazine about it um, and, and said, at the end of the day, we're going to fight the good fight, not only for our customers, but for the country. We're in this bizarre position where we're defending the civil liberties of the country against the government. Who would have ever thought this would happen? I don't think Tim Cook ever expected to be in this position. This is not something that he went and sought out. The government should always be there defending civil liberties. And there's this role reversal here. Um, at the same time, the New York Times, or following that, the New York Times did a little study where they were looking at the power of CEO activism. When, when CEOs come out and say, you know, definitively in one direction how they feel about a political issue or a topic like that and, um, and how much sway it has over, um, over you know, you and I, um, both in our political thinking but also in terms of our likelihood to buy products that those, those CEOs represent. Um, both go up is what they learned, uh, which is funny. Um, that Tim Cook um, could sway someone's political opinion and that um, those people would also be more likely to purchase an Apple product. Um, that was cropped intentionally. Uh, so German Chancellor Angela Merkel's chief of staff met with Mark Zuckerberg when he was in Berlin most recently to talk about why it's taking Facebook so long to take down neo-Nazi comments um, from, from, uh, from the site. These are posts that are happening on, on the German version of Facebook. Um, I mean, they all have these terms of service, right? Twitter, YouTube, all of them, around hate speech and how that'll get you kicked off and close an account. And, um, and they felt like there were things lingering too long. In fact, so much so, and this is unrelated to that, but there's a, there's a big lawsuit by several LGBT advocacy groups um, against Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook for um, taking so long to close these kinds of accounts down and removing the comments. Um, it's interesting, right? Like, they say that their job is to police these sorts of things. Other people say you're not policing it fast enough. They answer to advertisers and the government. Not really. It's just, it's super strange, these things that exist. And if you want to go to, like, the most racist, evil place on the Internet, it's in the comments on YouTube. Have you ever browsed those? It's, it's really disgusting. And it sucks, because YouTube's, like, the second most popular search engine in the world. On the, on the flip side, Twitter has suspended, uh, since the middle of 2015, over 125,000 uh, ISIS accounts um, that are being used to promote terrorist acts and recruit. Um, but it's, it's, it's actually mostly driven because of other users' complaints. Um, and they talked about setting up you know, other groups, dedicated groups, people who speak 
multiple languages to start to, to police this sort of thing, but it's this game of whack-a-mole where they're, you know, they're popping up and knocking them down and just as fast they're popping up again, um, which is disheartening, except that uh, they are seeing that when they pop back up, the accounts have lost a lot of traction, a lot of momentum, and they never achieve the number of followers that they had before they were taken down. So you can kind of argue it both ways. And people will dismiss the power of Twitter, right, for, to, to bring about social change, and at the same time, um, these two individuals, Jessica Stern and J.M. Berger, uh, two kind of preeminent experts on terrorism, and, and they wrote um, a six-point plan for defeating ISIS's propaganda war machine, and they um, published that on Time magazine. <clears throat> and number six in that campaign was the aggressive removal of ISIS Twitter accounts. So at the same time, you know, some people argue that these kinds of things don't really have an effect. And at the other time, they're making it like number six in the six-point plan to thwart a propaganda machine. So which is it? Is it really powerful at bringing around change, or is it something that we can all safely dismiss and say we've got to find other ways? I don't know. But maybe more interestingly is like who decides what to take down, right? What if we got to a point where uh, we felt that activities by some other civic group, not a terrorist cell, uh, was worth taking down? We don't like where this is headed. There's an imminent threat here. We should do something about it. We should remove some of these accounts. We should monitor them. Um, you get into these really weird debates about what to do next and how to handle that. What feels like a threat or what defines an act of aggression or civil disobedience? I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But I do think that we can do something about this. You know, this is sort of the, the bad rap terms that get thrown around when people use technology and things to, to bring about um, participation and, and change, right? So how do we as designers and developers and shapers of the internet uh, and champions of the user and user experience make new ways to engage and take action and bring about change? I don't want this to just be doom and gloom. It's like really heavy duty stuff right after lunch. Um, okay. Well, traditionally, this is sort of how it goes, right? There's sort of public research bubbling up, findings, you know, about something, statistics. That happens enough that some kind of very important person um, gets pulled into the campaign or becomes a face for it and begins to call attention to the issues. Um, that, in turn, moves certain elected officials to recognize it. When they make statements about it, that demonstrates uh, an observation of political momentum. Okay, this is serious. Um, and then there's this building of, uh, of like-mindedness as the thing kind of scales and the wave gets bigger. And then there's mass public pressure to do something. That's, that's usually how things get done and, and policy change happens. Um, but all of these things that we've got going on um, in terms of these, these new emerging platforms or existing social networks, um, they're kind of different. They sort of happen outside of that. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a cool thing to think about what we might build because we need action platforms, not, uh, not social networks, right? We, I said that at the beginning. The social networks aren't really designed to do this sort of thing. But we could take how they work and design other kinds of platforms that, um, that are on purpose that way, um, that, that support project-based creative, viral activism in real, tangible, long-term community building without institutional power kind of ways. Um, where we design and develop these things intentionally to be relevant and uncensored and unsponsored, right? All of those social networks answer to advertisers. So we can build some alternatives to that. Um, and if you're feeling really bummed about any of this, um, I highly recommend this book, Blessed Unrest, by Paul Hawkins, um, who documents, you know, um, this movement that's happening, uh, decentralized, and with roots in indigenous cultures and environment and social justice, with about 130,000, that's just, that's low estimate, groups out there doing good work, which is really comforting to hear. Um, and I wanted to share a couple of examples of things that are already in play that might be inspiring or, or at least give you some hope. So um, the uh, Atlantic magazine, City Lab, City Fixer, 
everything from aging to infrastructure and civic life to climate change, they're documenting things that are happening. And it's just one of those like, oh man, I'm glad I'm not watching the news and reading this instead, right? Like there's, there's great kind of case study here to get excited about whatever your, your, uh, your issue might be. Um, alternatively, this idea of looking at like what's happening and, and aggregating this data because nobody else is gonna do it. Um, the Guardian is making, uh, has built essentially a death by cop tracker because we don't do it very well in the United States, which is shameful. Um, the Bureau of Justice calls it arrest-related deaths, but that's essentially what it is. Um, and until now, there's, there's not been publicly available data in aggregate, state to state, um, gathered by the US government in any, in any real way to document when that happens, when people die under police custody and things like that. Which is crazy to me, because it's like at the core of so many things that are happening now in the news. And it, it happens in pockets. It's not that it goes completely untracked, but it's not being tracked consistently, city by city, county by county, that kind of thing. Because there's no incentive to do it. So you could withhold certain things like, you know, at a federal level, we're not going to give you, you know, the bulletproof vests that you need or these other pieces of technology that you need to do your policing job unless you begin to report on this. And then, you know, you might, might see something happen. And so the way The Guardian is doing it is it's all, it's all user-generated content. So if this thing happens, if you know this individual, um, you contribute to this. And so it's allowing um, people to document this work because the government isn't doing it. Um, yeah, that's, that's heavy duty. Similarly, Vice is tracking mass shootings in the United States. Again, because nobody's really doing it. Um, and they're using it and they're comparing it to what's happening in Europe, which, like you know, is way less. Um, and so they're, they're looking at large-scale shootings throughout the year. Uh, and just to kind of put things in perspective, more Americans have died in large-scale shootings this year, which we're barely halfway into, than all that died in combat in the Afghanistan conflict in 2015. It's crazy. Um, sites like this, Truth Voice and others that are, um, this one in particular is described as liberty-focused, independent news agency dedicated to breaking the most important stories, publishing hard-hitting investigative journalism, not unlike Vice Magazine, but it's just nice to update your feed with some other inputs besides whatever else we're digesting. Um, this is, just as an idea, um, there's not, there's not a, a lot of great um, video apps dedicated to documenting things that, like, um, like activists might want to capture. You know, like you can use your video, you know, camera on your phone or whatever, but um, the idea of layering in these other benefits to the activist, like, um, and these things come and they go, and I think it's just because they can't, I mean, it's expensive to host video and a bunch of other things, but <clears throat> like um, they have a, a fake erase button. So like being able to push it and, and say, no, 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 I, I've erased it, and it looks like it makes progress at erasing this video file, even though it's stored still. Um, ones that shoot, you know, kind of right to the cloud with, a bunch of uh, coordinates and other things, um, some with built-in panic buttons that would notify a small group of people that something's happened to you. Um, <clears throat> and so Witness is, is kind of like that. They're built on, um, on a really interesting open source video kit um, by this group called the Guardian Project who makes a lot of kind of cool SDKs and other things around this, this sort of stuff. But this is, um, this is backed by Peter Gabriel and Susan Sarandon and Gabriel Garcia. Um, and it's, it's basically that. It's techniques for shooting video of things that, you know, the journalism isn't capturing and how to use that video as evidence. And they produce field guides and, and trainings for, for how to do that in, in this accompanying app. And uh, Jeremy uh, Balenson at Stanford's VHI lab um, is looking at how to use VR to build empathy as this becomes more and more real as this, as this kind of sensational experiential thing um, they're doing all these studies where if you could sort of live in another person's shoes, um, uh, even for a moment, would it affect, you know, how you think about the world from a different perspective, taking on someone else's perspective. And so they've got this one where you wear it and you have like this, this virtual chainsaw. And it's, it's like a, a thing you actually grab onto. Um, 
and you saw down a tree, and it, and it feels real, and you, you watch it, you fell a tree. Um, and they've gone back and they've examined how those people use heavy paper products, even toilet paper. And there's a decrease in how they use it, just having you know, cut the tree down. And, and an average person um, will use two, two full-grown trees worth of paper in their, in their life. That's interesting. And they have another one where you, you put it on, and this woman's doing it here, and, and she's swimming. And they, they gradually pollute the, the space that she's in, that she's swimming in, um, uh, to try to see if that would curb how people um, think about pollution or waterways. All these really interesting ones. They, they have one where they, they map the old version of yourself. Um, and they were looking at how that might affect millennials' ideas of, of long-term savings by being able to have this dialogue with an old version of themselves. Weird, cool stuff. Uh, and ways that people are using technology to build empathy, um, not just you know, play visceral killing games. Um, Civic Hall is a space. Um, getting people together, uh, civic hackers and designers, it's, there's a membership to it, just that as a construct. It doesn't have to be technology. It could just be a space that we dedicate to this kind of activity and people can, can come and participate in, in real and tangible ways together and you get this, this great group momentum happening. Also out of Stanford is um, digitalimpact.io, which is basically helping nonprofits become better stewards of their data and use open source data and tools in really cool ways. There's awesome case studies um, and other uh, resources there. Um, Snap Donate, you know, when you kind of talk about like the number of steps it takes to just, just contribute to something in a financial way. Uh, with the app, you can take pictures of, of, any, of any charity's logo, and then it instantly pulls up the ability to donate right to it, which is really cool. I mean, all those, all those organizations need to register with, you know, with this app to, to get that connection made, but I think that's, that's awesome to just like happen by and, and I don't know, it's maybe a little bit different than a, than like a, I don't know, a little code, right? Because you sort of, you document it there. Um, this is one that has a little video to better explain it. Um, but it's an awesome use of, of technology, I think, to engage people um, in this really immediate donation setting. And it was, um, it was powered by Square and, uh, and Mezior. The first poster that accepts credit cards, the social swipe. When a card is swiped, the resulting donation can provide daily bread for a family in Peru, or help an imprisoned Filipino child return to a normal life, all for just two euros. Although it sounds simple, synchronizing the digital poster with a complex card verification system was a challenge. When the card was swiped, a secure process quickly authenticated it and activated a film sequence on screen. This all appeared streamlined thanks to specially developed software. And the posters had a lasting impact. When donors received their credit card statement, they were asked to turn their single donation into a monthly one. It's a small gesture that makes a big difference. The social swipe, making giving easier than ever before. It's cool. All right, so I mentioned kind of traditionally how laws and things get passed and that sort of thing. Um, and Popbox is working to build a platform where um, members of Congress can get a better sense of what their constituents feel through kind of a social media engagement. So it's sort of moving those conversations, which generally don't make it to the ears of the people we've elected to represent us on social media that exists, and to build a platform dedicated purely to that engagement. I'm happy to chat more about kind of how it works after this. Um, so I want to crush through with uh, the last five minutes with some, um, some real calls to action, some immediate like, okay, great, what, do, what, what, what might I do? So I pinged friends who are active in this space to ask them, you know, if you had a room full of really, really smart kick-ass designers and developers, what's your wish list? How would you tell them to get involved? <clears throat> so Shalene King, she's uh, Vice President of Partnerships at AIGA Chicago. Um, she said, uh, give actionable talks, like this one. Um, participate in civic hackathons. Um, there's a ton. This one in particular, uh, opencityapps.org is one she recommended. Help hackathons. If you want to go up to Canada, there's a kick-ass one there. Volunteer at local museums. Be a mentor, not just a reviewer. So when you're asked to go you know, look at students' work and critique it, 
um, tap into those kids and see um, not unlike what was talked about uh, yesterday in terms of longer term mentorship and, and ongoing um, apprenticeships. Um, help activist groups. Um, most of the time, their technology needs are really simple, something that you could bang out maybe in a weekend or with a few friends. It's often not really, really big things. It could even just be pointing them to something that already exists and not even building it from scratch. They just didn't know it. It's not their world to know it. But you could step in and be like, actually, there's five other things that you might use off the shelf that work like this. I'll help you get started. Um, show up um, and just observe. You should bear witness to the things that happen. Find the ones that speak to you and do something um, for the ones that, that you get excited about personally. Um, and this is another conference uh, that happens in Detroit, um, which is about kind of media ownership and media making and how you can equip other organizations to, to use the skills that we have here to, to sort of own media and make their own media. Um, Casey Gerald, co-founder uh, and CEO of MBAs Across America. He was the opening keynote at South by Southwest Interactive this year. Um, and he talked a lot about gaining proximity and this idea of building empathy. It's very hard to solve big challenges um, without having proximity to the people that, that are affected by those challenges. Um, I think the Pope describes it as weeping with those who weep. Um, go where you're uncomfortable. Uh, I think that's a really big thing. Um, bearing witness to that murder was, was maybe the most uncomfortable thing I've experienced. And I didn't go there on purpose, but I saw it and I couldn't unsee it. And I think that's important for us to do, to get riled up. Um, find your why, the thing that matters that you're going to invest some time and you've got to care about, care about it. Uh, there's a great post called the, uh, the Unexotic Underclass that he suggests reading, and then um, apply to the US Digital Service. Um, more on that. All right, I'm going to crush these. I'm getting two-minute warnings. Um, Jessica Yagen, uh, partner and CEO of Impact Engine, um, she said, uh, just the transparency of information, understanding money and how that flows and supply chains and, and making that clear to, to people so that um, you can then engage them differently politically, but also as consumers. Um, she had pointed to something at uh, uh, University of Chicago, these efforts around big data for social good and how you can get involved in, in things like that. Um, former executive director of Chicago Abortion Fund, my friend Gaylon, volunteer, not even from a tech standpoint, but just show up and answer phones or do you know, basic stuff, just exposure. A lot of organizations actually require you to do something like that before you help in other ways is to kind of come and participate and, 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 and do it the way they're doing it. Um, and then volunteer uh, to build that, that organization and app. Um, mentor young people and, and future activists. Help spread the word about, about, uh, about things. So um, 10 tactics. This organization in 2009, uh, the, the Tactical Technology Collective in Berlin, got a bunch of people, 132 uh, rights activists and technologists and designers into a camp for a week and just sorted out like all the cool stuff that was going on. I think we should revisit these tactics because um, they need new channels. At the time, 2009, like think about where all the standards were in mobile phones and their capabilities. Everything is so much better. Um, so if we took our ideas about new channels but then applied them to these, and these are online, um, so I won't belabor the point, but um, they map out really clearly from working with people who are actually doing this stuff on the tactics that they use. And none of these are technology dependent, right? These are, these are, these are ways of um, of bringing about change. And they do a really good job because every one of these is backed with multiple case studies. So they demonstrate how that actually played out in real life with this organization and brought about change. And then, then our job is to go, oh, cool, what channels could we build to support that? What experiences or interactions could we make that could bring those things about um, faster or easier uh, at less cost? So I want to close out with, um, with this quote. Um, Kentaro uh, just wrote a book called The Geek Heresy, Rescuing Social Change from the Cult of Technology. This is a, someone who described themselves as a recovering uh, technoholic, someone who went around thinking that technology was going to save everything and, you know, we just need more artificial intelligence and more robots and more of this stuff and, like, everything will be great if we can just keep harnessing technology and keep pushing it to solve these problems. And he kind of had this awakening and he talks about it in the book about how that's just not, it's just not true. Um, and now what he's doing as a professor and other people um, that he's involving in the work that are not, not of his ilk. And the reality is that 
powerful technologies will work in exactly the direction we point them in. Almost paradoxically, as more technology becomes available, human judgment and wisdom matter more. So, um, so yeah, I think to close out, um, just remember that technology doesn't change the world. We do. Thanks. <laughs>